Welcome to Bedhampton Church. Contact us at www.bedhampton.church. But for now, let's continue that journey with this input. What's the least I have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? That's what jumped out to me. I know those words aren't in that gospel message, but when I read, read that, that is what jumped out to me. What's the minimum I can get away with and still enter the kingdom of heaven? That's, it's almost like Jesus has got to this point and had enough. He's in the middle of, of a great teaching block where he's been, uh, in Luke, where he's been talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to see God's kingdom come. And it's almost like he gets to this point and he's like, you just, you just don't get it, do you? Because they've all been asking these questions. They've been saying, okay, well, what about this? And what about that? And do we have to do this bit over here? And do we have to knock the board off the wall? <laughs> do we have to do that bit over there? And you, I can almost feel the frustration in Jesus. Like, you just don't get it, do you? Actually, you can't earn your way to the love of God. He loves you already. That is impossible. And it's almost like they're standing there going, Jesus, what's the... The least we have to do. But really, actually, a worthy response is to simply love God and love others. That's what we read elsewhere, isn't it? That's what Jesus is really saying. It's actually, you can't own your way. You've got to just, the response of knowing that you can't own your way and it's been paid is to love God and love others. And then he sort of carries on teaching for the rest, rest of Luke as though he's just put that one to bed now and that's done and dealt with. And then we come to our epistle, our New Testament reading that Nigel read. And through the quirkiness of the Anglican lecture, we find these two books together. Philemon is, um, like I say, to call it a book is probably stretching it a bit really, isn't it? It's more of a note, really. 21 verses, one chapter, 471 words in my English translation I worked out. But it is a worthy note to read as we see Paul respond to a fellow Christian. The Christian theologian Lawrence Richards writes this, he says this about Philemon. He says, Paul's letter was written to beg a wealthy believer named Philemon to take back a runaway slave, Onesimus, without punishing him as harshly as the law permitted. The runaway slave met Paul while the apostle was in prison. He talked about him being an old man in the reading, didn't he? Paul's appeal suggests that Onesimus may have robbed his master for funds to make his getaway. Yet Paul describes Onesimus as faithful and as a brother. Apparently Paul led the runaway slave to Jesus and Onesimus has shown evidence that that was a real conversion. After his conversion, Onesimus has spent enough time with Paul for Paul to say that he was helpful and to love him. When you know that sort of information, you can go home and read Philemon with a different perspective, can't you? When you read Philemon, I'd encourage you to do so, as you saw it. You know, it takes a couple of minutes to read, over a cup of tea this afternoon. But when you read it with a knowledge of what's going on there, that actually it's an interaction between Paul as a church leader, bishop, if you will, and, and Philemon, who is a rich fellow Christian, you see actually grace beginning to abound in Paul's letter. When you read those words, understanding that Paul has the authority to just tell Philemon what to do, as if the bishop was to walk in today and say, Max, get down, I'm preaching, you're not. And yet, Paul's gracious approach is to let Philemon make that decision for himself. You see, Paul demonstrate what Jesus was speaking of in the gospel. In his interaction, you see him sort of almost say, even though I disagree with the way Philemon would approach this, how much can I love him? How much can I love him and allow him to move forward with the grace of God? Charge it to me, Paul says, charge it to me. Whatever you feel you are owed, charge it to me. Whatever you feel, wherever you feel you are wrong, charge it. To me, 
Does that sound a little familiar? When Jesus was on the cross, hanging there for you and I, with our sins uh, on his back and in his hands, he turned to Father God and said, charge it to me. Paul is demonstrating a response that says, here is the whole of my life. Here is my response to your love. What is the most that I can do to love God and love people? Charge it to me. Paul is modelling Jesus. It's been a busy week, and if I'm honest, I, I wrote this yesterday, which is unusual for me. But as I sat there yesterday, hoping that I'd already had a, ser a sermon somewhere about this that you hadn't heard from me, I had to real realise that there was, a, there was a message in this for me as well as for you. I felt that revelation on my shoulders. And I had to turn to Father God and say, where do I need to say, charge it to me? Where do I need to say, what's the most that I can do to love this fellow Christian that perhaps I disagree with? And so you know what's coming, my friends. Where have you responded to a brother or a sister in Christ? where actually you could have simply loved them and turned to God and said, charge it to me? Where have you been perfectly within your rights to respond to someone with something less than love? But now God is calling you to model Jesus. What situation floats through your mind right now through the Spirit? What face comes to mind through the Spirit? What is the most you can do to love God and love others. My friends, I love you, but where do you need to say, charge it to me? You have been listening to Bedhampton Church. Our prayer is that this helps you journey with Jesus and serve your community by sharing God's love and friendship. Subscribe and join us for more discussion at www.bedhampton.church. All material creative commons copyright. Contact us for more details.